Ladies and gentlemen, Sheriff Richard Mack. Sure, get the crowd all fighting and arguing. <laughs> <laughs> and then I get to get <laughs> No, that's all right. Um, I came out from Arizona, and uh, I'm really preoccupied with what's going on. Um, my wife and I we work uh, together with the CSPOA, and I hope you already know what that is. Constitutional Sheriff's Peace Officers Association, CSPOA. You are to memorize that, and then add .org to the end of it. Okay? Go to the website, see what we're doing. We are boots on the ground solution to everything that you're here for. There's not one thing that you're here for that we can't address, stop, change, alter, completely abolish with what we are pursuing at the CSPOA. You want, you want to be protected from the AD, NDAA? Then you need peace officers and sheriffs in your area to stop it. You want to nullify gun control? Then you need a sheriff and peace officers in your jurisdiction to stop it. You want to be protected from forced immunizations? And you need sheriffs and peace officers in your jurisdiction to stop them. Where do you focus on getting back freedom? Is there somebody still naive enough to think that that's going to happen in Washington, D.C.? If you would please stand and let me ask you. Uh, you're probably in the wrong meeting. Did you, did you, happen, did you, happen, did you come here by happen chance? Because there is no hope in Washington. If you're still giving those idiots money or calling them and emailing them and thinking they're going to do something for you, you are part of the problem. You have fallen prey to the brainwashing. Okay? The way we take back America is county by county and state by state. And you must be working with your local officials to make that happen especially the conservator of the peace for your county. And that's your sheriff. Your sheriff is the only elected law enforcement officer in your county. The only one. He is the only one that directly reports to you. And when he took his job, he did something that Oath Keepers have an entire organization about. He promised you in God's name that he would uphold, defend, protect, and preserve the United States Constitution. So he, you hired him directly, and he promised you that he would follow and adhere to the United States Constitution. Is there a better system ever? But it's been a little bit bastardized. And they've been bought off by some federal agencies, and through the evolution of the last 60, 70 years, he has been convinced that he's an officer of the court or that he has to obey everything that the state legislature tells him. And that's an absolute lie. Have you ever heard of a judge or a, have you ever heard of a sheriff maybe telling a judge, no, I won't do that? Would he be in his, within his authority to tell a judge no? All of you should not, yes. Not just a few. Yeah. Absolutely. Does the judge control the sheriff? Is he the sheriff's boss? No. no. The sheriff works for you. He is not an employee of the court. He is not an employee of the judge. The judge doesn't pay his salary and the judge doesn't hire him. Do they work together sometimes? Sure. I did. I told my judge no a couple of times, too. That was kind of fun. <laughs> Is he the employee of the legislature? Does your state legislature hire him? Does the county commission hire him? Does the city council hire him? Negative on all three. Did I already tell you who hired him? We did. It's you. And he reports to you, and you get to review his job every four years and see if you want to keep him or put somebody in that house in there. <laughs> that will keep his own. Did I say keep his own? They ought to start a group called Oath Keepers. <laughs> I they did. Oh yeah, I'm on the board of directors. I keep forgetting stuff. I, with, with, if my wife doesn't come with me, I forget. 
It's her fault. So I don't I want you to know the reason I'm preoccupied is my wife and I are spending uh, about 12 hours a day, and even when I'm traveling, on our CSP Awake conference this coming Friday in Las Vegas. And it's boots on the ground, focusing on the solution. Now, I will tell you, there's a lot of great speakers here, and a lot of them are my good friends. And I don't disparage anything that they say. But I will tell you that everything they said is wrapped up in our organization because we're the ones focusing on real change and on real solution. And I'm going to tell you some stories about how that has happened. I'm going to tell you about how uh, a small town sheriff in southern Arizona changed American history and stopped gun control laws. It was me. No, 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 no. Do you know that there were actually five great bills scheduled to be passed? One in 94, the next in 95, the next in 96, and the next in 97, and so on? There were five great bills. Have you heard all this talk about serializing ammunition? and regulating ammunition out of existence, that was Brady Bill 2. And it was introduced two weeks after I, I filed a lawsuit against the Clinton administration to stop the Brady Bill. And that I told them I would not participate in the Brady Bill even though they passed a law saying I would. <laughs> saying that all sheriffs in this country would participate in enforcing the Brady Bill. A gun control law that modified the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968. Why did we get the Federal Gun Control Act of 1968? Kennedy, Kennedy shootings, all of them. And so they were going to, this knee jerk reaction to all those horrible shootings of the 60s, they were going to stop it with the Gun Control Act of 1968. The Brady Bill came in 1994 and was going to modify it, saying that everybody had to go through all these horrendous background check. Now there might be somebody in the room here, I wouldn't expect too many, that say, you know, background checks, that's a pretty good idea. That's going to keep us safer. I think it's okay to do background checks because that's how you keep guns out of the hands of nutcases that would go into colleges and schools and start shooting and killing everybody. It didn't happen, did it? We're not stopping that because of the background. Do you already know we've been doing those background checks for about the last 20 years? Those background checks have been happening. And yet now they say we want more background. We want, we want universal background checks. See, the Brady Bill background checks. See, I did not stop. Our lawsuit did not stop the Brady Bill background check. They call it the severability clause. All the Brady Bill wasn't thrown out. What happened, though, is Brady Bills 2, 3, 4, and 5 never came up again after our lawsuit was filed. Howard Metzenbaum introduced Brady Bill 2 and it never made it out of committee because they were still looking at Brady Bill 1 being adjudicated in court because some stupid sheriff out in Arizona said, this is unconstitutional and you better take it to the U.S. Supreme Court to find out. Do you realize that a small town sheriff in southern Arizona, all by himself, said I'm going to sue the Clinton administration, takes it all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and wins. I can't. I can't. Bill Clinton's butt at the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, you know, Billy Bob, he'd probably be a good guy to go out and party with. And have fun with you know? I'm not disparaging that one iota. But you know, I was, I was glad that six other sheriffs joined the lawsuit. I was glad that the NRA came out and paid for most of it. I was glad that people across the country got involved in this. And yet most of you don't even know about the case. And it is the most forgotten landmark decision in American history. And so we're going to be talking about that because, yes, there is a way to stop gun control. The best way is for your sheriff to put all agencies on notice that gun control in his county will be will not be tolerated. And then it won't happen in this county. Are there some sheriffs that have already done this? Yes. Yes, there are. And I'm going to tell you a story about that. Now, the reason I bring up my lawsuit is just because I want you to know that it's possible to do things in the power of one. 
I, I'm not really not trying to pat myself on the back. I'll leave that uh, to my kids and my wife. But I want you to know that it, it, there is a possibility to fight and stand against what's going on today. You can do it. And if you're not involved in the process, we're not going to win this. And this conference that we're having here today is a waste of time. It's more important that you come in here, it's more important what you do on Monday than what you're doing today. Okay? You have got to get a relationship with your sheriff and local law enforcement and the city council. Forget stupid, corrupt Washington, D.C. Your sheriff can make them irrelevant. And we're having that happen. So, what is Every so often that goes up. What you're looking at here, we're going to go over it. You don't need to read it yet, but we are going to go over this because, well, sorry. <coughs> I like to move around. Um, what we're going to go over is pick some of the mic on the right. Yeah, there, I, I'd have to take both of them. No, just pick up one. that one. I only need this one? So I can move around? Yeah, yeah. Yay! All right. <laughs> so, this last three feet. <laughs> okay. uh, all right. Uh, now, this doesn't go far enough because I like to come out in the audience. When I say move around, I mean move around. Yeah, yeah okay. I'll, I'll, I'll stay. I'll stay. Um, and, and, and by the way, is there anybody in charge in here? Good. I'll talk as long as I want. How long am I supposed to talk? How long do I have? Serious. How long am I supposed to talk? Like a half hour. Half hour. You got 15, 20 minutes? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. Well, this, is, this comes from my decision. And let's first, though, I want, before you read that, don't read it yet. We're going to go over it together. Because it's part of the solution. I really want you to know that there is a solution. As a matter of fact, we had a convention. We've had our fourth convention will be this, this Friday in, in Las Vegas. And um, we had our third one in St. Charles, Missouri this past June. And the title of the entire seminar and, and the title of the, the DVD set that we put together pursuant to that meeting was Erecting the Barriers. Erecting the Barriers. Who would do that? Who would erect the barriers <laughs> against the encroachments of the national authority today? Because this was actually words from James Madison back in 1775. That we can safely rely on the disposition of state legislatures, in other words, state employees, that they can safely rely, uh, that they could erect the barriers against the encroachments of the national authority. In other words, the federal government. Who is supposed to keep them in check? Them? They tell you them. That they get to decide the size and scope of their own authority. And if it goes too far, they'll investigate themselves. <laughs> and then if you don't like it, you can sue them and go in their courts and ask permission to not go along. And that's why my case was such a miracle, because I told them that they were, they were in error, and that they had gone too far, and I had to ask permission in their courts to see if I was right. What a miracle to win in something like that, huh? And the judge that actually helped me the most on that was Judge John M. Roll, and three years ago, this month, he was killed in the Safeway parking lot in Tucson, Arizona. His name is Judge John M. Roll, very principled man, and I highly recommend that you see this book, The Magic of Gun Control, because it's the best Second Amendment book out there, and in this book, there's a chapter dedicated to Judge Roll, and I want you to know what kind of a man he was. He saved me. In every pretrial motion, in everything that they tried to throw at me to get me off of this case, Judge Roll told them no. He sided with me on every single pretrial motion. And as a matter of fact, they threatened to arrest us in the Brady Bill if we didn't go along. True story. Absolutely true story. So my lawyer said, let's get an order of protection against him from being able to arrest you while we're in court. I said, do you think we can get it? He goes, Judge Roll, I think we can. And we actually got it. 
an order of protection or a order of injunction against the federal the Department of Justice and the White House from being able to touch me while we were in court and we were adjudicating. Do you realize that? That, meant, that means I'm the only person in history to get an order of protection from, uh, against Bill Clinton. Against Clinton? Well, yeah. you'll, have, you'll have to talk to me about how to get those. Yeah. But uh, so you got to put that in perspective. Look at all the people who ever sued Bill Clinton. I was the. Uh, did you sue him? <laughs> He was. During the assassination attempt on Congresswoman Gibbons. He was killed at that event. Yeah. And, and they just had the uh, anniversary, the three-year anniversary. Did they ever mention Judge Roll? No. Not what I owe No. Six other people. That was Judge Roll. Six other people were killed when Congresswoman Gibbons was wounded. That's all they said. Okay. And so I always... And the one to bring him up. Do you think so, that he was... I don't know. I don't, I've been asked it before. Alex Jones and I talked about that on the show. I don't know. I don't, I'd like to go talk to his wife and get all the uh, phone records and see why he's there. But that's another story. Yeah? And it's it's crazy. However, um, with with that, I want you to know and understand that gun control in America is against the law, and anybody promoting it is a lawbreaker. But the intent of the Founding Fathers and the Second Amendment make it very clear that gun control is against the law. And so uh, I'm, I'm amazed at the miracle, and we all know where miracles come from. It was not me. This miracle of this case changed American history. And we're going to show you that this case actually talks about the solution that we are about to CSPOA. We are creating sheriffs all across this country and peace officers and chiefs of police who will put principles before politics, who will not allow policies and regulations and bureaucracies to supersede the Bill of Rights. And that if your God-given rights and your individual rights are being abused, that they will stop it, no matter where it comes from. And can you imagine anybody saying, well, Sheriff, the IRS is taking everything I own, I don't owe what they say, and I have no money to defend myself. What's he going to do? Dog, God, I wish I could help you. Do you know that you can? Do you know that you can stop this abuse? Why are you sitting there with your boots on the desk drinking your coffee when your citizens are losing their homes and everything, even sometimes children, to an out-of-control federal government? And you can stop it like that. We started an organization to do just that. And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about how I know this is already happening and already working. We've had Sheriff Palmer out in Oregon stand against the Forest Service for his people. We've had Sheriff Clark from Milwaukee stand for the Second Amendment and tell his citizens all to be armed. And he even fought with his own chief of police in the same community. Chief of police in his own party and a bunch of other people saying, Sheriff Clark, you idiot, what are you doing? And he was such a stalwart that we call him our Black John Wayne. <laughs> and he was our Constitutional Sheriff of the Year. And he spoke at this conference, Sheriff Clark did. He gladly and proudly accepted the CSPOA Sheriff of the Year from Milwaukee. Huge department. He, I, I mean office. Sheriff's office, not department. And this DVD is worth getting just to see his amazing speech. Do you know that this great stalwart of a man, keeps his pocket constitution everywhere he goes, and sometimes he hands them out. Reminds me of me. And, uh, it, it was an absolutely an astonishing conference. We're going to have another one this Friday. And this is to set the agenda to protect all of you from out of control government. And we're going to address three key things. How do we protect our citizens from gun control? How do we stop the NDAA, and how do we stop the abuse of the IRS? Mm -hmm. If any of you are interested in that, 
please join us at the CSPOA. We need every one of you to be a member. We need every one of you working on this. We need every one of you working on your sheriff to get him more involved with us. You want a constitutional sheriff in your community? Then you have to get involved. You can't wait for me to do this for you. There's almost 3,100 sheriffs in this country, and they, there's only one that works for me. That's Sheriff Arpaio in Phoenix. Okay? And I'm working on him. I guarantee you, I've been in his office several times. And we're working on it. Okay? Now, the two stories I want to portray to you really quickly. They're both quick, and some of you have heard them. And uh, one of them happened in 1955, December 1st, Montgomery, Alabama. An American citizen got on a bus at 7 o'clock after she left the, the tailor shop she worked at. And a white man came on the bus. And he said he wanted her, shit, uh, her seat. And the bus driver told her to get out of the seat go to the back of the bus. Go to the back of the bus. Does our government say that to people today? Ask the Amish farmers who aren't allowed to uh, sell their raw milk. Ask gun owners. Ask farmers. Ask ranchers. There's a lot of people that still get put at the back of the bus. They just switched them from group to group. Rosa Parks refused. The uh, bus driver got off the bus and got on a payphone and called the police. And two deputies came and arrested her, took her to jail, fingerprinted her, and booked her into a jail cell. Fingerprinted, photographed, and booked into a cell. Can you imagine? Do you know in, in the jail, I used to run a jail, that you have to put a jail roster and log in the charge. Can you imagine the charge next to Rosa Parks' name? Failure to give her seat to a white man. This happened in America. We still have a lot of abuses and a lot of places to go and, and, and a lot of work to do. And we're trying to do it. And uh, I want to ask every sheriff and every chief and every cop, and you can help me with this question. If you were called back in the time, knowing what we know now about fairness, about constitution, about our God-given rights, and about equality, that our whole system was supposed to be based on. If you were called back to Montgomery, Alabama on December 1st, 1955, what would you do? Enforce the law? Teach this troublemaker a lesson? You don't get to pick and choose which laws, do you, Sheriff? I get that all the time. Sheriff Mack wants us to pick and choose. Sheriff Mack wants us to decide what's constitutional. Yeah, you're required to. You promised that you would when you swore your oath. You didn't swear to support any decision by the courts. You didn't swear to support anything the, the black robes in Washington say. You didn't swear to support any law. You swore in God's name to uphold and defend the U.S. Constitution. Will you keep your word, Sheriff? Now you're back on that bus. You walk up to Rosa Parks. You're looking, looking her in the eye. Do your duty. Sheriff, what will that be? Hopefully, he'll look her in the eye and shake her hand and say, Mrs. Parks, what you did tonight took a lot of courage. And it would be an honor for me and my deputy to escort you home safely. That is a constitutional sheriff. That is what you want. <laughs> We had a similar incident. Just happened this year, 2013, March 8th. Floyd Parrish, a law-abiding citizen, driving home early evening, gets stopped on some fudge probable cause by a deputy sheriff. Gets pulled out of the vehicle on a minor, minor traffic offense. Gets pulled out of the vehicle. The criminal? He had a gun in his pocket. So he goes to jail for having a gun in his pocket. He didn't have his permit. In Florida, you have to have a permit. You have to get permission from the governor or from the government to have a 
gun in your pocket. Sheriff Finch finds out about it. And he says, you know what? If the Second Amendment protects an American citizen from anything, it protects him from going to jail just for having a gun in his pocket. He went, he went into the jail, released Mr. Parrish, and told him to go get a permit, and the charges are all dropped. So the governor comes in and arrests the sheriff. And the sheriff is booked into his own jail. Booked into his own jail, relieved from his office, suspended without pay. How's he going to pay for lawyers? CSPOA came in. Oath Keepers came in. And we defended him and helped pay for his defense. Raised over $45,000 for Sheriff Finch. It wasn't enough. He still owes $65,000. Wow. We're still working on that. Sheriff Finch, if any of you would like to come meet him, will be in Las Vegas, our keynote speaker, this Friday. He'll be there. His story is valid. It's vital. And it's living proof what we've been all praying for. A sheriff that would put the Constitution before stupid state statutes. He's the one that walked up to the bus and said, I'll escort you home safely. He did that with Floyd Parrish, who was told to get to the back of the bus and even arrested. Sheriff Finch is who we've been praying for all this time, praying that there would be a sheriff to stand. He's among dozens and dozens of others who have done similar things across the country. That's what we're doing at CSPOA. We're creating more Sheriff Rogers and more Sheriff Finches and more Sheriff Clarks, more Sheriff Palmer. And we'll have about 50 sheriffs there and other chiefs and, and police officers at this convention. And they're going to be helping us uh, create this agenda to take this nationwide. It won't work without you. I want you to come up. Back to my table, you get some of these tools, but no tool is better than this. What you see on here is in this book. Now, this book will only cost you a dollar at my table. It's a little pocket size. It's not a constitution. It's a review of my Supreme Court case. It's a highlighted version of my case, and this is in it. It also has something in here that says, we have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction. That's in here. That's in the United States Supreme Court decision. It also says, but the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. Have you ever heard of such propaganda? The Constitution protects us from our own best intentions? Only if we have officials that keep their oath. It's a meaningless piece of paper if we don't have officials that are doing it. And that's where this comes in. That's where you come in. And that's where we come in at CSPOA and Oath Keepers working together to make this happen and actually put boots on the ground for a solution. Would you love that there was a solution? Yes. There's a solution to every bit of this that you've been hearing at this conference today. There is a solution. It's called Constitutional Sheriffs. Oath Keeper Sheriffs. Do you want one in your community? Yes. Join with us in what we're doing. All of you can become members. We need you. We want you. You have to be a part of this or it's not going to work. Look at the solution. This is in the United States Supreme Court, Mac, Prince, two small town chairs that took this all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Let's read this. You want to see the solution? Residual state sovereignty was also implicit, of course. Residual state sovereignty was also implicit, of course, in the Constitution's conferral upon Congress of not all governmental powers. Where have you heard such balderdash before? <laughs> United States Congress doesn't have all governmental powers. Well, surely they have 98% of them. Surely they have most of them. What do they have? Very minuscule, and what does he call it? Only discrete enumerated ones. Where do we see that? Article 1, Section 8. They don't have very many powers. So then, how do we make sure that they stay within those enumerated powers? What does the Supreme Court decision say in this? It's only rendered express. Rendered express? Does anybody know what rendered express means? It means absolute. And yet you have so many people have told you the Constitution is not absolute. It has no absolutes. Even the Bill of Rights, when they're intended to be absolute, not to these liars and these crooks in Washington, it's not absolute. 
It's absolute to us at CSPOA. Your right to keep and bear arms? Yes, it's absolute. Can you commit a crime with that? No. Can you get a, commit a crime with freedom of speech? No. We'll go after if you do. But everything else until you hurt someone else is absolute. You absolutely have the right to choose what kind of gun you want. Or what kind of ammunition. Or if you have 50 guns. Or 60. Or two. It's up to you. So, how do we keep the enumerated powers rendered express? Rendered absolute. How do we keep it that way? He tells us, by the Tenth Amendment, by the assertion of the Tenth Amendment that says, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, <coughs> nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now let me ask you the ten thousand dollar question. Who constitutionally, lawfully, and morally has the duty and responsibility to enforce and secure the Tenth Amendment and state sovereignty? Can you name me anyone in your county or in your state that has that responsibility? County commissioners, city councilmen, dog catchers, state reps, school boards, teachers, anyone working for government, governors, we the people, and absolutely the last line of defense, erecting the barriers for you and your citizens, is the sheriff. Chief of police, does he have the responsibility? Absolutely. Cops on patrol, do they have the responsibility? Absolutely. How do we do this? We make sure that sheriffs and cops understand their oath of office, understand the Constitution, and understand that there is a Supreme Court decision that applies directly to them in the enforcement of Article 1, Section 8. You know what? It's starting to work. I'm not coming here to give you a dream pie in the sky that there might be a possibility of a, of a solution. We're doing it. It's already happening. But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. It divides power among sovereigns and among branches of government precisely so that we may resist the temptation to concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution to the crisis of the day." End quote. What I just, what I just quoted to you is in this little booklet. You can come and get this booklet at my table for a dollar. This book cost me $400,000. I pray that you'll get involved in this process. I pray for America. And I pray that we'll be successful in what we're trying to do. Do you know what? We're trying to avoid the armed conflict that they're trying to promote. This is a peaceful, effective process. Join with us in the holy cause of liberty. I thank you so much for your time.